Good morning, good morning, my church family. Welcome back to the Church Without Stress Arms. I'm your lead pastor here, Pastor D, and I am so excited to bring the Word of God to you this morning. And I'm glad that you have chosen to be back with us, to fellowship with us, to experience God with us. Because every time that we meet here, whether it be in your house, my house, uh, God's house, over Facebook, social media, wherever it is, we know that the presence of God is there because the, the scripture tells us where two or three are gathered and they agree. What does it say? There I will be right there in the midst. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah today. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap today. Type in the chat. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Because if you are ready to receive, God is ready to give you his word this morning. Amen. 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 Let us bow. Let us invite God into this place this morning, into our hearts this morning. It's only God, we come right now. We are so grateful, so thankful, God, just for already what you're doing, God, in the midst of this worship experience today. God, we thank you, God, today that we are experiencing you, God. We get to experience your love. We get to experience your, your, your joy. We get to experience, God, unspeakable joy. And, God, we get to experience your word today, God. So speak through us, God. Speak to us and through us, God, that we might be able to take this word, God, put it in our hearts, God, that it may be planted in fertile ground, God, and grow, that it might spring forth fruit, that when we leave this place, God, we'll be able to share this word with somebody else, God. So touch us and speak to us today. Speak through me, God, as your, as your man of God, your vessel, your instrument, that I may be able to be obedient to your word and obedient to your voice. In the mighty name of Jesus, all the saints of God said amen and amen. Amen. Um. We want to look at, at Joshua chapter 7 this morning. We want to look at Joshua chapter 7 this morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, you've been following along with us through the crossover series. Man, this series is getting better and better. Or well, as, as the older folk used to say, it's getting gooder and gooder. It's getting gooder and gooder. So go to chapter 7. We only want to deal with one verse today. I told y'all before, and I tell y'all uh, many times after this, I'm not smart enough to deal with more than one verse. It, the Bible is too, too rich, too complex for me to be able to, to deal with more than one verse. I try to, but most times, to me, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm in my element because <laughs> God can only give me so much here uh, in this one verse. So let's just look at Joshua 7, chapter 1. I mean, Joshua 7, verse 1. It reads it like, it reads like this. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. He that had ears to hear, let him hear today. But the Israelites, but, but, but. But, interesting that this starts off with but. Because I want to use for a take-home thought today. Get your butt out of the way. Get your butt out of the way. And let's look at this, and, and because I, I, I want to break this down. Normally, I give you guys some you know dramatic intro, but I, I want to be able to just break this down for you so we can be able to dive into this thing. First, understand, when you read the Bible, that it's not written in chapters. Let's first understand that the Bible is not written in chapters. When the books of the Bible were originally written, there was no such things as chapters or verses. Each book was written without any breaks from the beginning to the end. And chapters and verses were not, at, were not added in the English Bible until 1560 in the Geneva Bible. And they were added for the, 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 the convenience of the reader. So chapter 7 begins with the word, but. Beginning with the word, but, if you know anything about the word, but, but can be a preposition or a, a conjunction. It's adding thoughts together. But can mean without or except the fact. For an example, uh, we would have protested but he was afraid. Are you walking with me this morning? So after taking a close look at this text, I believe that if you truly look at it, you would agree with me that chapter 7 is a continuation of chapter 6. And it's not meant to be broken, but it's actually meant to be bound to chapter 6. 
preferably and considerably verse 27 when it reads, So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. So when we're talking and we're looking at this, we know all too well <laughs> the allure of, of fame and, and what comes with it. Those of us who are music fans, you, we, we all were fans and, 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 and love Whitney Houston, arguably one of the greatest uh, female vocalists to ever, ever sing a song or, or grab a microphone but many of us would agree that it was it was her, her it was the fame that she had and the celebrity lifestyle that truly can be a drug itself but substance abuse isolation mistrust and and and, and that becomes some type of dysfunctional adaptation to fame that can lead to untimely death look at Whitney Houston, look at uh, Judy Garland, look at uh, the King of Pop, look at Michael Jackson. So what I'm saying is that there's a price to pay for success. Ah, there's a price to pay for success. See, all of, all of those who, who have been famous, they at some point hit their Jericho, which was that monumental point in their life that, that set them off and that really propelled their popular uh, uh, fame status look at Whitney Houston uh, it was uh, her, her I will always love you song but soon after the drugs took over look at look at Michael Jackson it was his thriller but soon after that the sin of insecurity took over even if we look not only at historical people but look at the biblical historic likes of David who, who killed Goliath and became popular one of the most popular kings ever known but it was his sin of lust that came soon after. Even if we talk about the Messiah, look at Jesus and how he performed the miracles and particularly raising Lazarus from the dead, his popularity grew to the point where the Sadducees and the Pharisees knew that they had to kill him because everybody was gonna start believing him. Sin, what I'm saying is with the fame, sin is always lurking. Sin is always lurking. Sin is always lurking beyond the butt. Oh, come on, somebody. Sin is always lurking beyond the butt because it's the butt that silences the fame and introduces the sin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, let's go, y'all. Let's go. This is going to be good. The butt silences the fame and introduces the sin. Think about it. How many times have you been saying, you've been here and you've been in church, you said, I was going to join church, but... I was going to pay my tithes, but I was going to go to church, but I was going to forgive her, but I was going to do better by my children, but I was, I was going to stay married, but the but always comes in a way and the but normally most often always introduces some type of sin. Can I be honest with you? Your but will prevent the momentum of your progress. Mm, come on. Yeah, that's good. That's good right there. Your butt will prevent the momentum of your progress. See, the one thing that you have to know and you have to understand that going in, into the promised land, the finish line was not Jericho, but the finish line was not Jericho. Jericho was only a hurdle that was to get them to into the promised land. What you trying to say, preacher? What I'm saying is, is that God has tore down your walls. God has already given you what he needs to give you, but that's not it. It wasn't just so God could save the life of Rahab. It wasn't just about saving her life, but it was so that she might have life uh, and have life more abundantly. What I'm trying to say is, it wasn't just about conquering Jericho because my Bible, woo, my Bible tells me that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So God has so much in store for us. Ah, we can just get our butts out of the way because butt will forfeit your future. 
But will will put shackles on your dreams. But will destroy your destiny. But will arrest your opportunities. But won't allow God to be God. So it's important that you get your butt out of the way. Ah, oh, come on, somebody say hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah this morning. Yes, 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 yes. But you know what? Here's what I do want to say. One of the most famous butts in the Bible. One of the most famous butts in the Bible is actually found in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, Joshua 24, 15. Some of my Bible readers know where I'm going with this. When I said 24, 15, you already got in your mind because 15 says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But ah, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, that's what I'm saying. But negates everything that comes before it. And that's why there's power in the but as power in this little three letter word it's a three letter word but it it, it 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 contains so much power because it can be able to connect two stories but also that that little small three letter word has the power to negate or cancel or diminish every accolade that you ever had before when you use the word but or when but comes into play oh oh yeah 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 so this takes us to our first point today. And I only want to give you three points and I'm out of your way. The first thing is, if we look at the text, is that there was a spiritual infidelity. A spiritual infidelity. Look at the text. It's although Joshua's fame spread because of Jericho, Israel's unfaithfulness provoked God's anger. Ah, oh, I need you to see this. I need you to see it like I see it. I need you to see it like I see it because you have to take, uh, you have to take it all uh, conclusively. You got to put it all together because Joshua fame spread. And, 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 and I need you to see it like this because uh, a lot of times we, we uh, misconstrue things. The fame that he had was not based on anything that he himself had done. And just like many of us, the fame and the favor that we possess is not because of what we do, but it's only by who's on the inside. It's the faith in who we serve. It's the faith in God that allows us to have the favor amongst men that will put us in a position that now we're able to re receive favor from others. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But after the fame, after the fame, somebody say after the fame, after the fame normally comes the but. After the fame normally comes the sin. Israel's unfaithfulness provoked God's anger just like a but. Negates everything that came before it. Joshua's fame is shattered by sin. It's shattered by sin. And that's exactly what sin comes to do. Watch this. That's exactly what sin comes to do. Sin comes to shatter uh, your dreams. Sin comes to shatter your reputation. How many people, if you're truly honest, can, can testify today and say, too many people know you by your shortcomings. Too many people know you by your sin. Out of all the good that you've done for people, the only thing it seems like they can remember is the thing that you fell short on. The only thing that it seems like people want to remember is what you didn't do. Ah, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. All they can remember is your shortcoming, but that's exactly what sin comes to do. Look at this, and I love this. Ooh, watch this. This is beautiful. There's an intentional contrast here in the text. There's an intentional contrast here in the text. And I want you to see it and I hope you can see it the way God has shown it to me. Because I, I, I want you to see the effect of Rahab, which we talked about last, last week. The effect of Rahab, Rahab's belief in God made her and allowed her to become an Israelite. Now we're in Joshua 7, and Achan's, he is a disbelieving Israelite, acted faithlessly, and as a result, 
was not delivered, but will be destroyed. Mm, let me back up. Let me back up because I want you to get it. You got a Canaanite woman who believed and was saved and became an Israelite. And now we have a disbelieving Israelite who acted faithlessly and it's now going to be destroyed. And ultimately, he became a Canaanite. Mm, some of y'all missed that. Some of y'all missed that. Some of y'all missed it. You missed it, you missed it, but let me break it down for you. What I'm trying to say is, is this. Is that you can be all dress, dressed up. You can wear all the suits you want. You can go to all the church functions you want. But if in your heart you don't have the belief and the faith of God, you could be all dressed up, living well, and on your way to hell today. And that's why it's a heart issue that has to be changed. And we got to understand that it's a problem. It's a problem when you can't tell the unbeliever from the believer. It's a problem because now the world is confused. Ah, oh, the world is confused because sin, sin is, it's, it's, it's an infectious disease. That's what it is. Sin is an infectious disease. Here's, here's how I'm going to tell you. Because Achan acted alone. Look at the text. It said Achan. It didn't say anybody else. Achan acted alone. But the verse twice mentions Israelites. But the Israelites. The Lord's anger burned against who? Israel. Twice mentioned Israelites as the guilty party. So what I'm saying to you uh, this morning is this. Is that one man's sin can infect an entire nation. Ah, oh, that's good. One man's sin can infect an entire nation. So what I'm saying is it, it, it'll sin will spread. and but, it, but like cancer, it'll spread. And it has to be cut out in order for you to survive. In order for you to survive. Look at it. It says. Taking the devoted things. Taking the devoted things. Aiken was acting. In a way that broke a fundamental covenant. Between God. And Israel. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Unfaithfully. That word unfaithfully. That word unfaithfully. Uh, means broke faith. Means he committed a trespass. Yeah, I like that one. I like that word. I like that word. Let's stick with that one. He committed a trespass. It was it was an infidelity. It was not faithful to the marriage. And we're talking about a, a trespass. It's, it, there's a, a difference between a, a little difference between a sin and a trespass because sin is 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 missing the mark, but but the aim is to hit the mark, but just you missed it. But but to trespass is a deliberate, a deliberate disobedient act that violates the law or violates the vow or violates the commandment. Look at Ephesians 2 and 1. Well, Paul writes, you were made alive when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It's a violation of law. It's a violation of law. So, so what are you trying to say, preacher? Here's what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say to you is this. Is God is saying, we are married, baby. I've fallen in love with you. You are the apple of my eye. I'm telling you that I love you. you you're the only one I want. But, but what I need you to hear is these vows. Look how, how, how smooth God is. That's why I love God. That's why I love being a child of God. Look at what he says. See, ain't no woman ever heard nothing like this. Watch what he said. He said, I'll never leave you mm, nor forsake you. Woo! Come on. He said, where I am. There ye may be also. This is my favorite. This is my favorite line that he says to us. This is my favorite line that he said. Watch it. He said, greater love. Oh, had no man than this. Than he that'll lay down his life for a friend. That's, that's, that's love right there. That's the kind of love that, that we have when we serve God. And all that he asks for in return is that we keep his commandments. That's what he asked for, that we keep his commandments. So what you're saying, here's what I'm saying. It's time for us to stop cheating on God. 
It's time for you. It's time for me. It's time for us to stop cheating on God. Cause look at what he said. He said, Israel has sinned. This is in verse 11. Look at verse 11. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. Wow. They have stolen. Now, these were the things that first belonged to the Canaanites, but after they have been devoted, now they belong to God. They have stolen, they have lied, and they have put them in their own possessions. The devoted things, the devoted things, the devoted things, the devoted things now belong to God. So I saw this and look at what, look at God. When they devoted these things, these, these were the first fruits of Jericho that were given to God and devoted to God. And I saw this because it's, it's, it's in here and we must see it, is that we can't take what belongs to God. Mm, come on, come on, come on. That means your tithe belongs to God. And he gets, he, he gets upset when you take what belongs to him. That's why in Malachi 3 and 10, he says what? He says, will a man do what? Rob God. Because you're robbing God because it does not belong to you, but it belongs to God. Ah, oh, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me move on. Let me move on. Folk don't like when you talk about giving, Deke. Deke, Deke, Deke. They don't like when you talk about giving. But here's what my mama told me. My mama told me this. If somebody lie, they'll steal. And if they steal, they'll do what? They'll kill. And look at what he's saying. They stole. They lied. Then he said they put them with their own possessions. That means this is your secret. Oh, that's, this is that thing that you thought you could get away with. This is that private sin that you thought that you could cover up with the smiles or you thought you could cover it up with your clothes or you thought you could cover it up with your makeup or with your fake lies. But truthfully, you know that un down below and underneath all of this, this fleshly stuff that you have, that there's something going on that's eating away at your life and that even though you fooled everybody else and everybody else might seem as though they don't know, God knows and he sees everything that's going on in your life. But it's amazing how it's not until you fail that you look for spiritual insight. Which is our second point today. It's amazing. It's not until you fail that you look for spiritual insight. Spiritual insight gives us three things. Because spiritual insight is, is, is being guided without God. See, Joshua sent the spies as, as, as he did before. And, and I heard a preacher say it like this. He said that the children of Israel lost the battle because they were overconfident. And I would like to respectfully disagree because I truly believe that they lost because they were guided into battle without God. My spiritual uh, uh, um, uh, validation is this because it, it was three things that that I saw in this that are important that will validate my point is because the first thing is is that without the spiritual insight and, and being guided without God you lose the focus you lose the focus because here he sent the spies out and the spies came back and they said all we need is two or three thousand we don't need everybody matter of fact some people can just chill out take the rest of the day we're going to take two or three thousand go over here win the battle and we'll come right back but the thing that I, I need you to see is, is that the one thing that they always did before everything, before crossing over the Jordan, before uh, um, demolishing the walls of Jericho is, is they always kept the presence of the Lord and the presence of the Ark of the Covenant first. And that's why I truly believe they lost focus because here in the text, it doesn't show, it doesn't talk about them taking the Ark of the Covenant with them. And what I want you to know is that anytime that you don't possess the presence of God and you call yourself going into battle, you will fail because you lose focus because your focus is not on God and your focus is now on you oh come on somebody come on you lose focus and and the things that you should see 
You don't see because now that you don't have the presence of God, you lack the spiritual wisdom. You lack the spiritual vision. And now the sin that's inside and the sin that's on the inside of the camp, now it blinds you and blurs your vision. And you can't see what you need to see because you don't have the spiritual insight that you have. So now you underestimate your adversary and the focus is on you. And it's not on God. The second thing is this. The second thing is this. You lose the fight. You lose the fight. Sometimes I, it, it just it bothers me that, that we, we lose so much. How many of us, you, you've lost the business deal. You wonder why that you lost the business deal or, or why the investment didn't go through or, or why your marriage didn't work, why you relocated and you still have the problems or or. Why the job is, 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 is not calling you. It's because too many times we enter into some type of covenant or we enter into a relationship or enter into some type of engagement and we don't take God with us. Ah. Mm, we don't take God with us. And so for that, that's why we find ourselves sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we say to ourselves, how much longer do I have to put up with this? Because we keep losing the fight. But I stopped by to tell you today that without God, defeat is inevitable. Without God, defeat is inevitable. And the reality of it is, yeah, you can do good for a little bit by yourself, but I stopped by. What if you just took God with you? How much more would you be able to maximize your potential if you only took God with you? Oh, come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you lost focus. Now you lost the fight. And let me tell you something. There is nothing worse than losing a fight. That you know you should be winning. Oh, that's good. There's nothing worse than losing a fight that you know that you should be winning. Let me just save somebody a therapy session this week. Let me save you a therapy session. Because here it is right here. This is where the stress comes from. The stress comes from the, the overwhelming and the anxiety of knowing that I should be operating in mastery. But in yet I'm operating in failure. I should be operating in mastery because he told me that he would never leave me nor forsake me. He told me that anybody, any army that came against me, nobody would be able to stand. And here I am now losing the battle. I'm losing the things that I shouldn't be losing to. I'm, I'm, I'm failing because there are certain things that I know that are smaller than me, but they're still beating me. I'm tired of losing. Somebody is tired of losing the fight this morning to, to battles that they know they should be winning. But you got to understand who you are. But if you don't take God with you, uh, uh, if you don't take God with you, this is where the stress comes in. Look at verse 6. It says, then Joshua tore his clothes, fell down to, to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there until the evening. The elders of the Israel, they all did the same thing. The stress just, it was too much to understand, like, how did this happen? How did I get here? I thought I did it all the right way. I thought I was doing it. I'm better than this. Uh, how many of you said that? I'm better than this. Uh, the third thing is this. Then we lose the faith. Look at what it said. As a result of the defeat, the Israelites feared greatly. Their hearts melted and they became like water. Remember when, when uh, the spies were in, in verse 2 when they talked to Rahab and she said after God had dried up the Red Sea, they heard about it and everybody's heart melted in fear. Now all of a sudden, here we are fearing greatly and now we are, our, our hearts are melting with fear and they became like water. And because of Achan's sin, Israel had now become the Canaanites. Oh, man. Israel had now become like the Canaanites because now the, they had lost the faith and now they were operating out of fear. Let me tell you something about that. Where there is faith, fear cannot live. That's why my Bible tells me that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, 
and of a sound mind. So fear has no dominion here. And sometimes you got to eliminate fear. And the only way that you can eliminate it is by increasing your faith and understanding that fear has no dominion in my life and it's not of God. Oh, can I give you some hope today? Let me give you some hope today. One feat, one defeat doesn't have to shape your identity. <laughs> one defeat doesn't have to shape your identity. One defeat doesn't have to shape your identity. Here's the thing. He brought us over. Think about it. He brought you over for a purpose. He delivered you out of the hand of the Amorites. And now what you're trying to tell me is, is, is this is what Joshua is saying. He's saying, Lord, why did you even bring us over here? Why did you even bring us over here? And now we're getting ready to die. We could have just stayed where we were. God, we, were, we could have just been content because we were safe in the, in the couple of victories that we had. Oh, that's good. We were safe in the couple of victories that we had on the other side of the river. But let me stop by to tell you. Let me put a pin in this thing so you can truly understand what I'm saying. Is that sometimes if you're going to if you're gonna walk in your purpose, walking in your purpose doesn't require safety. Because see, safety requires you to stay in the, in the same place. But walking in your purpose does require security. And when you're walking in your purpose, God... I will provide the security that you need doesn't mean that you won't have to overcome some things but it does mean that while you're walking while you're running while you're stepping into your purpose stepping on the land that everything that your, your foot touched now belongs to you if you just keep the presence of God first in your life if you keep the faith in God ah he'll make sure that he never leaves you nor forsakes you. Woo, that's good. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I know the certainty of the past seems preferable over the difficulties of the present and the uncertainty of the future. But you have to remember what got you here. Ah, come on. You got to remember what got you here. My problem is, is how fast we forget what God has done. Oh, ye of little faith, you got to understand and you got to remember that God has Red Sea power. Not only does he have Red Sea power, but God has dry ground power. Not only does he have dry ground power, but he has peace be still power. He has take up your bed and walk power. He has wall collapsing power. And if you remember what God has done in your life, now you can understand how to take the next step, how to fight the good fight of faith, how to be able to conquer all of your demons. And, mm, yeah, how to be able to defeat your enemy. Let me run on to my clothes. Let me run on to my clothes. I know y'all ready to go. I know you're ready to go. Let me run on to my clothes. Last point, last point. Last point. Spiritual infidelity, spiritual insight. The third thing is spiritual is spiritual introspection. Spiritual introspection. See, Joshua was only thinking about I. He was only thinking about defeating I, the land of I. He was only thinking about that. But what he didn't know is God had to tell him, God said, Israel has sinned. Mm. Mm. What he was saying to him was, and what God wants us to see, it's not the enemy but it's the inner me. Ooh. Come on. Somebody need to hear that. It's not the inner me, but it's the inner me. And they will not ever be able to defeat another enemy if they didn't first defeat the inner me. And if we're truly honest and we have to accept the fact that sometimes the enemy doesn't come from the outside, but the enemy comes from within. And it comes from within when, when, when you don't have everything surrendered over to God. You got to be all in. If not, that's why Paul says uh, he does things that he doesn't want to do. Oh, uh, let me just read it to you. Let me read it to you, then I'll close. 
I want to read this to you. Romans 7, starting at verse 14. And I want you to look at the word, how he emphasizes the word, but. Watch this. We know that the law is spiritual. But I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave into sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Mm, this is good. Can I keep going? 21. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Ah. Uh. Can I give you verse 25? Can I give you verse 25 before I go? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. What I'm trying to say is to your family is that even though sometimes you're in the promised land, even though you defeated one of the greatest feasts ever, that sometimes the enemy is not on the outside, but the enemy is on the inside of the camp. And you got to be able to destroy the enemy of your mind. And being able to destroy the enemy of your mind is getting control over your will, getting control over your thoughts, and getting control over your emotions. Well, preacher, teach me something. How can I kill the enemy? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's how you can kill the enemy. You got to do what he told Joshua in chapter 1. And you have to meditate on his word day and night. Because his word says that you got to make God a priority. The next thing is you got to praise him for what he has done. And then you have to make your purpose to glorify him. And then you have to stay in the appropriate posture of worship. And the last thing is you got to be patient. Ah, and wait on God. What I'm trying to say is that you got to be able to kill that thing that's on the inside of you. They took Achan and they, they stoned him to death. They stoned him and then after they stoned him, they burned him because they understood that not only we got to kill him, but we got to kill everything that's attached to it. And that's what God is calling you to do. Kill everything, every sin that's on the inside of you. You got to give it over to God. Oh, you got to give it over to God. I'm done. You got to give it over to God. <laughs> you ask yourself, how do you find Jesus in this preacher? If you look at the text, if you look at the text, let's look at what it says. It says, Zerah, the son of Judah. <laughs> That's why it gives us the lineage. And it gives us the lineage because he wants us to know if I kill the sin, then he can live. Uh, if I kill the sin, then he can live. Understand God's wrath is not to destroy you, but it's to destroy your sin. It's to destroy your sin. So if I destroy the sin, kill the sin, eliminate the sin, surrender the sin, what am I saying? I'm saying I'm, by killing Achan, allowing the tribe of Judah to live, be, now the lion of Judah can now emerge. What I'm trying to say is that if you kill the sin, now Jesus can't emerge in your life. And once Jesus emerges, ah, he reigns. He reigns forevermore. 
The doors of the church are open today. There may be one. And God is saying, hey, it's your time. And I want you to come today. Make up in your mind today that you're going to serve the Lord. God bless you and keep you as my prayer.